Today we have a very special guest with us, uh, Dr. Jorick Gaines. Um, Dr. Gaines, simply referred to as Dr. D, which she likes to be called D, is an award-winning neuropsychologist and scientist who investigates brain and mental health. She's the author of Combating Dementia in 30 Days, a comprehensive evidence-based course of educational videos and a follow-along book. Dr. Gaines pioneered the first neuropsychology and well-being public education radio show, The Dr. D Show, in 2014. She received an academic excellence scholarship to UCLA and completed a bachelor's degree in business economics and accounting. She received her PhD in clinical psychology with specialization in clinical neuropsychology and completed postdoctoral experience in neuropsychology at the Veterans Affairs of Greater Los Angeles and UCLA Longevity Center. Dr. Gaines received awards from the American Psycho Psychological Association, the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging, the Veterans Affairs of Greater Los Angeles, and Fielding Graduate University. Dr. Gaines currently serves as an expert on the criminal panel for the Los Angeles Supreme Superior Court as a principal investigator at the Veterans Affairs uh, West Los Angeles and as a medical reviewer for applied neuropsychology. She served as clinical faculty at UCLA's Department of Pediatrics, adjunct faculty at Fielding Graduate University, and a secretary and board member of the National Academy of Neuropsychology Foundation. Currently, she is the CEO and clinical director of NeuroHealth Incorporated Neuropsychological Assessment and Treatment Center. That saying neuropsychology three times really fast is a challenge in itself. And she's got a PhD in this stuff. So let's just welcome to our podium, Dr. Gaines. So it's wonderful to be here today, and I can just walk around, yeah? Wonderful. So I kind of want to wish everyone have a wonderful morning, and it's my pleasure to be here today. I'm going to give you a little bit of a review about who I am and why am I talking about dementia and memory loss, which are very, very important areas and are very scary for a lot of people. So we're going to demystify it today. I wanted to share with you that um, I am a doctor and on my other life I'm also a mom to four children and I just had my uh, fourth baby four months ago and <laughs> a little boy and I'm very blessed and very busy and uh, my parents are aging too. When I was a little girl my parents owned a retirement center. Um, of very healthy, active individuals. Some of them were in their 80s and in their 90s, and my mother was a nurse and running the medical side. And I volunteered as a teenager, and I also volunteered on the medical side of things. And I had to do some things that normal teenagers weren't doing. But that taught me a lot. It taught me how beautiful aging is. It taught me how much wisdom older individuals have. It taught me that each person is a whole world. It's a whole world of information. And so I kind of fell in love with it. And there's nothing more beautiful than a comprehensive person, you know, that has got many, many stories and many lessons that they learned over time. And so that kind of gave me the love and the interest to work with older people, but I didn't know I'm gonna do that when I'm a professional one day. So I did go through and jump through a lot of hoops that have to do with brain behavior. I started in business, and I found that a lot of people talked to me about their private issues. And they didn't want to talk to me about their tax return. They wanted to talk to me about their husbands and their wives and their kids. And I went back home to my newly married husband, and I said, I was 24 years old, and I said, I think I'm in the wrong business. And uh, making a long story short, I signed up to the PhD program and because I enjoy analysis, I enjoy data, and I enjoy looking at profiles and making sense of things, neuropsychology was perfect. Now, how many of you know what neuropsychology is? Oh, good, we've got maybe 10%. Um, <laughs> so the reason is it's not, it's not uncommon for most people not to know what neuropsychology is. So it's a big word and it says neuro and psych. 
So the job of a neuropsychologist is to be able to identify conditions that affect brain and behavior and how the two come together. It can happen all the way from ages four to 99. It actually can happen with newborns as well, but when we look at diagnosis, we want to be responsible and we look at those ages I mentioned. That means that a lot of the conditions you hear about, such as autism, ADHD, but also mental health disorders, schizophrenia, bipolar, and the most common, depression and anxiety, and then on and on as we go to older age, uh, and in older age, we talk about post-stroke, the scary word of dementia, and other types of conditions are diagnosed by neuropsychologists. What's the difference between your neurologist, your psychiatrist, your psychologist? You've got all these different clinicians, and, and which one should you go to? So what I find is that most patients that I see don't really know where to start. So, Every person, every clinician in, that I mentioned has a piece of the picture, and they, their specialty provides a particular thing. Essentially, psychologists provide therapy for psychological issues. They generally do not diagnose, that's not their specialty, um, and they do not uh, provide medications. Psychiatrists dab into the diagnostic side of psychology and provide you with medications to address those, what we would call psychotropics. Neurologists look at your brain, and they do an assessment of your neurological condition, and they're able to order imaging and other types of medical tests you may need to take to address what potentially they're seeing. Neuropsychologists have one leg in the neuro side and one leg in the psych. Neuropsychologists take you through a series of exams, okay? A series of exams that have been measured and tested on thousands and thousands of individuals of your age and level of education and many times ethnicity, etc. And they look to see where do you fall. And in particular conditions, such as the onset of memory loss, we would see that the person is scoring significantly low in particular areas. Now you know a lot about memory. Most people hear about memory loss, but our brain does a lot more than just memorizing information. And so when a neuropsychologist does testing, the neuropsychologist looks at everything that, that we know to look at. It looks at how you speak and how you think and the content of it, how you process visual information, how you process your emotions, all of that and much more, your speed, your motor speed, your fine motor, your gross motor, et cetera, all of these different areas. And we, this is the reason you spend a few hours with us. We test everything, we get a profile, and we see where you stand. Now, why is it important to go through this, these four, six hours of testing? The reason is because we like to know if someone starts to have a cognitive problem, we like to know early on. We like to know early on because at the beginning stages of any neurological condition or neurodegenerative disorder, there's a lot that we can do. So even though sometimes you may be worried or afraid about getting tested, we always ask that we prefer that you would go and check with the professionals and talk about it versus not to, because there is so much that we can do at the beginning. Now, in terms of medication treatment for um, uh, memory loss and dementia, unfortunately, as it stands today, we do not have a medication that's going to cure any one of the types of dementias. We have various medications that can address the symptoms, and some medications can slow, for some individuals, can slow down the decline at particular stage that you're at, at the beginning stages. So even though we really would like to get excited about a lot of different things that we hear on the news, as a researcher, I will say that nothing today is set in stone in terms of having a significant and long-term improvement 
for your brain in terms of curing from dementia. And that's the reason that I called my course Combating Dementia, not Curing. Because you do have ways to combat the condition. So, in my lecture today, I will talk to you, I will give you some examples and samples of things that research shows us over and over and clinical experience can actually make a difference in how your brain works and that we can actually measure a change, a positive change in your brain. None of it is a magical pill, but those are things that you can do, and that's the good news. So we'll talk about it today. Um, I will also say that when a lot, one of the biggest questions is whether MRI, um, DTI, PET scans, all the different types of imaging um, uh, content that we get for particular clients, whether that is the diagnostician tool. So just so you, you are clear about it, imaging, while it can be very sophisticated, it's like a camera essentially, and it's taking a snapshot of your brain at a particular time or your brain activity. Each type of imaging provides you different type of information. MRI, to be more uh, basic here, MRI gives you structural information, the structure of the brain. PET scan gives you metabolic activity in the brain. But it really is sort of a snapshot, and it doesn't mean that it, we get all the information from it. In fact, neuropsychological testing generally shows the problems about two years earlier than imaging would show. So when clients say, well, I know that you found that I have this decline and, and that I'm scoring really low here and there, but the imaging didn't show anything. That is not an uncommon uh, situation. Now, what can we do? The first thing to understand is that the diagnosis stage is important. When we say the word dementia, it's just an umbrella term for various types of patterns and conditions of cognitive decline. So the, under the umbrella of dementia, you have the most commonly known Alzheimer's, but you also have vascular dementia. You also have something called Lewy body. You also have Parkinson's-based dementia. So there's all different kind of types of those dementias, and it's important to know which one it is because each one progresses, tends to progress differently. Each one of those conditions needs different treatment. Each one of those conditions may have different symptoms to address. And so it is important to get the diagnosis correct. Now, at the beginning stages, it's difficult to know exactly what the person has, and you will commonly see that your report may say, possibly. If the imaging supports it, it will say, probably. It will not say 100%. And the reason is because it is difficult to pin this down at the beginning stages. And, and so there's going to be a lot of interaction you're going to have with the clinicians that take care of you. And you definitely want, my advice to you is to go every six months or so and check in with your neurologist and the general standard of practice to get neuropsych testing done once in two years um, in order to make sure that uh, your problems are addressed properly, um, compare the baseline to potential new changes, etc. Now, can we make a difference for our brain? Can our brain live longer? It can. And some of the things would be the things you wouldn't necessarily think about. And there would be some things that I mentioned today that your doctor may have not had the chance to tell you about. And that's the reason, be probably, because your doctor is seeing 30, 50 people a day, and you got to be in and out, and there's all this wealth of information that we can't possibly share with our clients in a quick meeting. So when I thought about it, and I thought about everything we actually know, I put it down in a book, and I put it down in a way that's very simple to read. These are short chapters, but everything that I'm telling you in the book is what we know. And this way, you can learn in your own time, in your own space. Because there are several things that you want to look at. 
One of the things when, when we uh, think about our brain health, we need to think about the brain as a very dynamic body. I like to say that the brain has a mind of its own. And it really does. It kind of goes to different places. For example, one of the symptoms of youth is imagination, right? When you talk to a little kid, everything is possible. And they can see everything in their mind. And then their dreams are vivid. One of the areas that we would like for a person to understand the brain is to know that it has a capability to create. It has a capability to create information and pictures. And the creativity component is what makes a brain very youthful. So in the most fundamental, basic um, level, when I look at a patient's schedule, let's say that a memory loss or a cognitive decline begin. How does the person spend their time? How do they spend their week? Are they engaged in activities that get their brain to work? If you don't work it, you lose it. So you have to, you have to exercise your brain. So going to art classes and music, and by the way, um, learning a language and learning a musical instrument are the two activities we know uh, clinically measured to actually make a significant change in your brain. So if you really want to pick up on something, pick up a language or a musical instrument. And learning a musical instrument is learning a language, right? So there's a similarity there. But creativity, engagement, how do you know that you're retaining your verbal abilities if you barely talk, right? So you need to be social. So I like to look at the schedule of the person and say, how many times do you go out of the house? Who do you talk to? What do you talk about? And a very quick, fun exercise to do that actually challenges you, that, I, that you could do for free, you do not have to go and spend money on, pick up the newspaper. Take a small paragraph from the newspaper, and like my good friend did here <laughs> earlier with me, and discuss, discuss that particular topic you just read with your friend. It's one thing to read information, it's another thing to say it to another person. Lots of times people tell me, well, you know, I read a lot of books. And then I say, okay, what did you read yesterday? Well, what was the name of the book? I don't know. <laughs> um, what was the information about? So it's one thing to read, because we think we're getting a lot out of the reading. But unfortunately, reading is actually a very automatic task. So we're quite used to it. So individuals who have actually even moderate dementia could still read. It just doesn't mean that they're actually retaining the information, right? So what I would say, take a small paragraph that's new, information you're not familiar with, and then talk about it. Talk about it with your spouse. Talk about it with your child. Talk about it with the nurse, whoever sees you. And see your, yourself, your own ability to hold on to that information and speak it back to the person. That's one of the ways, in fact, that we test your ability to remember. And so I'm talking about socialization. It's very important. I'm talking about fun activities. I'm talking about creativity. All of that is very important for your brain. And you know what's really great when you're older? You're not going to go apply for a new job and you really need to know this information. You know, you're not doing that because you have to make 15 bucks an hour, you know, or send your kid to college. You're generally just going to do it for fun. So being assigned to do something for fun is how you need to think about it, okay? Now, why fun is important on a neurological level and chemical level in your body? When you have fun, all kinds of great, great activities take place in your body and your brain. One of the number one killers for brain cells, now I get everyone's attention, is, <laughs> is uh, cortisol. And what is cortisol? It's the stress hormone. Stress is so bad for you. Now, here is the scenario. I've got a wife and a husband sitting in the room, and the husband has some memory loss. And I'm interviewing them. And I'm asking them some questions. And the husband says, well, you know, I'm not sure. I don't remember. And then the wife flicks him on the arm right away. What do you mean you don't remember? I know you remember. Of course you remember. 
And so he's right away stressed. He's not saying anything. He's locking down. He's like, you know. How many times a day does this happen for this gentleman? I don't know. Now, she loves him overall, right? We say overall after 30 years of marriage or 40 years of marriage. Overall, good. Um, she loves him. She wants him to get better. She's not doing this intentionally. And it could go the other way around, by the way. It's not, it's not uh, necessarily just uh, wives to husbands. But putting him in a situation where he cannot do what he cannot do at that moment in time, and increasing his stress level is actually going to be further harming to him, right? So if you know that the person, the, you know, they function within the ability that they can function in terms of memory or anything else, sometimes it's OK to let it go. And it's OK to laugh it off. It's OK. And I'll tell you why it's even recommended to laugh it off and why now you have a prescription to laugh it off. Because laughing, a genuine laugh, actually creates excitation in the frontal lobe, in the frontal area of your brain, which is a very important area of your brain. It creates a natural sparking of that area, activity there, that a lots of activities don't do. And we want excitation in your brain. So your next recommendation is, believe it or not, to laugh. To go to places that you can laugh, maybe comedy show, watch things that you enjoy, laugh together with that. Have your kids do that with you. You know, if they come to visit, go do something fun that's going to make you happy. It is healthy for you. So avoiding stress is very, very important. Whatever responsibilities that you have on you that you don't need to have anymore, Try to delegate it off. When you talk to your kids and, and your grandkids, tell them, you know what's really good for grandma and what's really good for grandpa? To laugh. Tell me good things. It's OK to tell our family what we need, OK? So that's really important. Then they know that that's healthy for you. So that's another thing you can do. Now let's talk about the two things that doctors always like to recommend to you, even the doctors who smoke a cigar and have a big belly. <laughs> you know some of those. Um, exercise and food and diet, right? How many times do doctors tell you, you got to exercise, you got to eat healthy. You got to exercise, you got to eat healthy. How many of you heard this? Here we go, the whole room. Okay. So, how many of us actually do it? Oh, that's enthusiastic, okay. And how many of us really, really do it, don't just think that we do it? Okay, you know when you go to the gym and you have a really good chat with your friend and then you go a little bit like this with the weights and then you go home and you had this perfect outfit and you're like, yeah, this was a great workout. So. No pain, no gain, right? OK, so why am I talking about this? Because it's probably one of the hardest areas to get people motivated. And yet, over and over and over, studies show that exercise and great eating habits make a measurable, clinically significant change in your brain. It really does work. We don't want to hear about it. We want a magical pill. I've had it with many conversations. But yeah, yeah, I heard about exercise and that. Now, what could you give me, doctor? OK. So that's kind of a problem for us clinicians because we really know it works. In fact, recent studies showed that for individuals who work out, if they didn't work out for two weeks, we could see the difference in their brain. Only two weeks. And imaging shows that. So that's how important exercise and good eating habits are. Now, I'm a realist. So I always say 80% is better than 10%. 70% is better than 5%. That's how I do it. Because I know that people are not perfect. We're not made perfect. And we're not going to be perfect. So although some of my colleagues, I've got some world-known um, doctors who eat everything raw, 
almonds and everything else and take a bunch of supplements and they really do look like they're 10 years old and they're like 90. You know, you know those people where you're like looking at it, you go like, oh. But we're not like that. Most people are not like that. So that's not gonna work, by the way, for all my patients. It's not gonna work. Some of my patients that I get, they're the traditional American diet, okay? They've got pastrami sandwiches, they've got the bacon in the morning, they've got, and they sit in front of me and they're like, I'm not buying what this little girl's saying. So I gotta deal with that, right? So here's how I sell it to them. First of all, there's a scaring technique, you know. Dementia, okay. Then there's this, but that doesn't work that well either because they have memory loss, so they get out of my office, they don't remember. <laughs> so, okay. And so then I, I gotta go another way. So my other way is I know what gets people to remember. What gets people to remember? So laughter gets us to reduce our, our stress and laughter makes us remember situations because it creates what? An emotional reaction. Anything that, that gets you to have an emotional reaction increases the chance of you remembering the information. So when you go to a party, you are likely to remember the person you really couldn't stand <laughs> and the person you really liked. Why? Because they got you going emotionally. So I got to get them excited. So I started to look into the area of food appreciation. And food appreciation is very important when you age because there is a condition called anorexia of the aging. Anybody ever heard about this? I'm just curious. Wow, only like three hands. Okay, so anorexia of the aging is a condition that's normal, first of all, in the sense that as we age, we tend to have less appetite and we're interested less in eating. And as a result, we eat less. Now, if we have already memory loss, we might not remember that we didn't eat. In fact, there was another study that measured behavior of older individuals at the home and noticed that they believed that they ate lunch, but they didn't. Very interesting. Now, we have some people that have the opposite, where they believe they didn't eat lunch, so they ate like five lunches. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's not commonly what we have. Um, so generally what's happening, you're eating less. Now, I like to equate the body, I equate the body and the brain to all kinds of things. I think I abuse the idea of brain by now, but I like to equate the body to a car. So when the car is very young, you know, it's a very new car, you're getting a new car. And you could drive it like crazy, you can stop all, the, all you want on the brakes, you do all kinds of things, and the car is still going, because it's a new car. You're abusing it, but it's a new car. When the car is older, we know all these beautiful antique cars that are still going, but what does it take? What do we need to put into that car so it'll keep going? Maintenance, a lot, a lot of maintenance. It's the same thing with our body, it's the same thing with our brain. When you're older, you just can't afford running the same way you were running when you were younger, right? I'm sure you heard it many times. But it's one thing not to do the things we're supposed to not doing. It's a whole other recommendation to do the things you should be doing. What are the things you should be doing? So what we find is that a lot of individuals don't eat enough. They don't eat nearly enough what they're supposed to be eating when they're older. Now, I do a little reality test in uh, my office and I tell the person, what do you eat? Oh, I eat very healthy. I know all about nutrition. Okay, what do you eat? So they tell me I eat chicken and I eat vegetables and I eat fruit and I eat this and that. And I say, okay, do a little exercise for me this week I want you to write down, I give them a calendar of every day, and I want you to write down every day what you eat there, when you eat it. Of course, everybody hates this assignment because you have to deal with it all day. You, you put it on the fridge and you gotta record it, but they do it. And then they come back and we have a very different conversation. And almost every single time people say, 
you know, I don't really eat as much as I thought I do. And I don't really think I eat a variety of foods at all. So what we find is that most people eat one or two fruits during the week at best, not really the five or six that they like to list to the doctor. They don't eat many vegetables. They don't eat good quantities. They don't eat enough of all the foods that they need. And they don't have a lot of foods that have good nutritional content in it. So what's happening really is that you're not providing your car with the maintenance that it needs. You're not giving it the oil that it needs. You're not giving it what it needs. So when you're doing that, you're, going, you're reducing the chance for your body to work for a long time. So getting the nutrition that you need is really, really important. So I'm actually telling you to eat more, but eat differently. Now I'm not going to talk today all about food because it's a lot of information and it's to change the way you think about eating and the way you think about food and the way you enjoy it. And so in, in my book, it's seven chapters out of the 30 that talk about all kinds of things that you need to know. But I will say, in general, that the Mediterranean diet is very good for you. Getting a lot of proteins that are vegetarian-based, like garbanzo beans, hummus. Getting a lot of seeds, putting seeds in your food, pumpkin seeds and sunflower seeds and, and other types. They're very healthy for you because they have good fat in them and they, they get you, um, they provide other processes in your body to operate well. Um, and a variety of the, what we talk about, fruits and vegetables. Now, every person may have a different medical condition, so my disclaimer, always run it by your clinician, by your physician, to make sure you're making changes that are okay for you. But in general, the choices of what you eat, there's only so much of what you're gonna buy in the market and there's only so much you're gonna eat. So whatever it is you choose should be well thought of, whatever you actually decide to consume. Some things are like a triple whammy that I like to call it. Like good quality salmon, um, and notice that I said good quality, um, the, where it's coming from is important. There is a company that actually tests the fish that it sells you. It's called Vital Choice um, that I like to use, and I have no gain in it, by the way. Um, they actually test the mercury and other toxins in the, in the fish before they sell it to you. So for example, take salmon, which people really enjoy, is what I like to call a triple whammy, because it's a protein, it's got good fat for you, and it's got, it helps with uh, calcium uh, in your body and the ability for your body also to retain that calcium. So if you already eat something, I like to eat something that's going to have a lot of nutritional value in it because you're not gonna eat so much. Another thing that's good to do is put little snacks, healthy snacks around your house. What we find is that people, if they don't see the food in older age, especially if there is memory, loss, um, they, if they don't see it, they don't eat it. So if you put a little basket with, with some um, healthy snacks, not overloading, by the way, on nuts. Nuts have a lot of, a lot of heavy fat that could be hard for your body to process. Um, but things that have more seeds and more natural protein and dried beans and there's all kinds of things um, is actually going to increase your chance of eating. So having a great diet is really, really important. Enjoying what you eat and take your time with that and enjoying the tastes of things. So we know that as we age, one other thing that likes to decline is your, your senses, your ability to taste, to smell, and in fact, the ability to smell is associated with, sometimes, with a memory uh, decline. And so you definitely want to continue and enjoy a sensory experience. And that means anything that has to do with touch, with smell, with taste, with hearing, with seeing, get yourself stimulated. That stimulation goes directly to your brain. Now we used to think, and this is a, an exciting comment, yay, everybody wake up that's sleeping, this is a good comment coming. Um, we used to think the brain doesn't grow anymore, okay? We used to think that. 
Um, and technically, it is true that up until the age of 40, we still generate a lot of new cells. And right there around 40, which I'm just about to hit soon, I'm going to start losing some brain cells. Now, good news, we have a lot of brain cells, so we can lose a whole bunch. But um, what we know now, there is a field called neuroplasticity. Anybody ever heard of that? Yay, great. So we know, actually, that your brain is capable at growing new cells and growing and developing connections even as you go to a very old age. And the reason is because your brain is that magical and it has the ability to do that. However, it takes a lot more work. It takes experiences that are different for you, something that you're a little bit uncomfortable. So did you ever hear about how being uncomfortable is where growth comes? Yeah. So every growth comes with a bit of a sense of discomfort. So whatever that discomfort you have about, you know, or little fears or whatever not, Try to see if you can overcome it and give something a shot one time. Now, let's touch on the other component that your doctor always tells you to do, but you never like to do it. What was it? Exercise. Thank you very much. So, exercise is the thing that most people, when they think about exercise, they're like, uh, I have to exercise. Especially if you're a cerebral person. So what we find, what are the cerebral people? The people that like to think. People that are in jobs and professions where their brain is their tool, okay? So the first caring mechanism is that if you take pride in the fact that you are an educated individual who gained a lot in your life by your knowledge and expertise, you should be worried. You might lose it. So that's the scaring technique which works a little bit. And then we can talk about why exercise could be fun and actually really um, a positive experience for you. So when you go to exercise, okay, I always recommend don't make it miserable. Most of the times people have the guilt feeling. They're like, oh, she talked about exercise. The next day they put their gym clothes on, they go to the gym, they work out for three hours, okay? <laughs> they kill themselves, they go home, they're in horrible pain. The next day, they're in worse pain. They can't get out of the bed, they have maybe some injuries and all of that. So they wait until the pain goes away, so then they don't go to the gym for two weeks, and then the <laughs> chances are they just don't go to the gym anymore, right? Now, the reason you don't wanna go to the gym is because it was a negative experience. Let's face it, you made it negative. It was not fun. So, I always recommend when you go, every time small steps, Go and have some fun first. Do a little bit. Enjoy it. And every time you can add more and more and more as you're enjoying the experience, you're much more likely to continue and wanting to go. Now, a physiological fact is that most people go to the gym groggy. And so it takes some time. You know, you're going on the treadmill or you're going on the machines and you're kind of like in a bad mood. But it takes about a good 10 minutes before your endorphins kick in. So you really need to know, going into it, that you might be kind of having a groggy, nasty mood for a little bit, but stay with it. Because suddenly, 10, 15 minutes later, suddenly you're smiling, you're having a good time. And that's because your endorphins kick in. So that's another cognitive strategy for you to know what to go for, to know that this is how it's gonna be. Let those endorphins kick in. Another piece of information that's important is what exercises are actually good for your brain? So, as we age, there's some things that we cannot do. I have knee problems, I have back problems, I have shoulder problems, right? That's the reality when we're older. So, there's some things that can work for some individuals, but I want something that works for everybody or most of everybody. So what we find, based on many, many studies actually, that there is a type of exercise that is actually showing measurable changes in your brain. Anybody has an idea? Okay, dancing, weightlifting, boxing. Okay, 
So all of these things that you mentioned, they all make a change in your brain. I was just saying before that two weeks of not working out is going to show. But there is a one particular activity that we see does several different things and works for older age and works if you have medical conditions. And that's called Tai Chi. Tai Chi. Tai Chi. And the reason Tai Chi is so powerful is because of several factors. The movements of Tai Chi are really originate from combat moves. So when you see individuals going very gently like this, you know, it actually was you know, a defense move, a strong move. Many of the movements in Tai Chi, they are orchestrated to get your body to do one important thing we look for, which is large movements. Because as we age, our body constricts and the bones are weaker, our range of motion becomes smaller, you want to fight that back. So you want to do large movements. You want to do big movements that extend your body. That's one thing that Tai Chi does. Because the movements in Tai Chi incorporate your body in different directions and make you move within your environment, they fight another problem that we have in aging. Balance, propensity to fall, and what else? Visual spatial decline, which makes it difficult to move within space and time, which makes us more likely to get into car accidents or bump into things or fall or drop the glass. So, Tai Chi fights that too because it makes your body, it makes you pay attention to how you coordinate your arms and your legs and the rest of your body within space. It also gives you a routine and a sequence. Routine and sequence, very important for your brain because it gives it a challenge and it provides you with something you need to memorize and follow. It also does another benefit. Because the movement extends the way it does, it increases blood flow to your extremities, which increases what? Circulation and oxygen. Oxygen to your cells and to your brain. So you're getting, remember how I told you I like the double whammies, the triple whammies? And I like the things that do a lot for me with one thing. And also, Tai Chi, the way it's made and the way the movements are, it's, it's rather kind on the body. While in yoga, and I like yoga too, it has a lot of benefits, but you have to go down on the ground, you have to do all kinds of bends that, that don't work very well for older individuals, Tai Chi doesn't require you to do that. And Tai Chi Qigong is more stationary. So even if, let's say, you're sitting on a chair, you could still do a lot of these exercises. What we see is just three months of being in Tai Chi classes twice a week actually shows a measurable effect for your brain and your body. So it's really important to know that experiencing with certain, experimenting and experiencing certain things that maybe you've never done before, but they may be good for you, is something you might want to consider. Now, I talked about all of these different areas, and I want to talk about a couple more. One of the biggest questions is, are there cognitive exercises that I can do? Is uh, our programs like Lumosity online? How many of you experienced Lumosity? Just curious. OK, not too many. Um, do they matter? Do they matter for the brain? OK, so here's what we know. A lot of these programs are repetitive. A lot of cognitive exercises that you see online for your brain, they are repetitive. So the first time you do them, it might be difficult. It gives you some challenge. The next time you're doing them, less of a challenge. And because the techniques repeat itself, you're not gaining too much benefit from it over time. As it stands today, we cannot say this particular program is going to change your brain. So even programs like Lumosity say that, that they do not have data that supports 
um, your brain necessarily improving on that. The key factor is that it has to be new, challenging, and changing. So if you want to do certain things, like I said, you have to be comfortable a little bit with the uncomfortable. Okay? Now, creativity is a great brain booster. So what we find is when people engage in art, painting pictures, creating certain things, um, several positive things happen. One is that it helps with emotional regulation. I had a, um, I was running art class for the Longevity Center, so I was running the memory program for early memory loss at UCLA for two years, and I helped design it. And I was running a, an art class, and one of the individuals was a very old-fashioned um, insurance, insurance uh, gentleman, and he said to me, look, right off the set in the class when the class started, he looked, look, this is all nice, but I don't paint. It's not a thing I do. So I'm just going to sit here. I'll, I'll, I'll listen because I like you, but I'm not going to paint. All right. So I said, OK. I put the paper in front of him. I put some paint there. And then I started talking. What I find is that we all have initial resistance to all kinds of things. And I did some negotiation with him, and I had him help somebody. And I finally said, what is the thing you love the most? And he said, you know, I used to ski a lot. I can't ski anymore, but I used to ski. And I could see that he was very sad about it. It's a thing he loved, he did for many years. And then he had an injury. And he said, I really wish I could ski again. And I told him, I said, you know, I don't know a lot about skiing. Would you paint it for me? Not for you, but for me. And he did. And it was the most beautiful picture, by the way. He did a really great job. But you know, we're in an art class with people with fun, so there's no competition. Um, and he really had a great time painting it. He painted a particular area he used to do a lot of skiing in. And he had the best time. And he told me at the end, he said, you know, I haven't had a chance to feel these feelings ever because I never let myself feel them. And I could see the tears, and I could see, I could see how he felt. And it was such a catharsis for him. And so what I'm saying is that creativity and art, and I've seen it, by the way, not just with him, but with other individuals, it's for the fun, it's for the benefit, it's for you knowing yourself better. And when we get older, we do like to express a lot of those feelings that we have. As we age, there's another component, and now it's in the mental health side, that makes us decline faster. And I want to say that that's even more influential what we find for males than females. <coughs> Anyone has a guess? Yes. Sexuality. Sexuality. Human sexuality? OK, we can talk about that, too. We'll talk about that if you like. Um, Somebody said, though, the word I was looking for? Depression. So depression likes to creep up on us when we're older at different moments and different times. And it may relate to a host of reasons. The more life we lived, the more there is in those suitcases. There are the divorces. There are the children. Do we still have them with us or not? Did they do what we wanted them to do? Are they a joy or an aggravation? Um, jobs, uh, money, all the things that make us real in those suitcases. And so it's very normal for human beings to be at times depressed. Now, of course, there are psychotropic medications that can help you if the depression is severe. It can help you modulate that depression. But it's not enough. It's not enough. So what we find in older age, there is a type of therapy that I really enjoyed practicing and that I like to recommend. And it's called reminiscent therapy. Anybody knows about it? 
One person, two, okay. So reminiscent therapy is actually a, a technique that's developed um, over time and has been practiced uh, with older age in many, many places. And it's one of my favorites because it, is, it does what it says. It allows the person to reminisce on times in their life and events and things that are purposeful and meaningful to them. As we age, purpose and meaning becomes everything. I sat with a 55-year-old, you might say a young dude, uh, who is a world-known clinician. And he has 3,000 clinics all over the world. So he wanted me to work for him. And we had the nicest conversation. And he wanted me to do research in things that he's developing. And I said, Dr. So-and-so, why are you doing this? You're making millions of dollars every year. You've achieved the top. What do you need to go through all this craziness? And he said, I want to be meaningful. I want to have a purpose. So it's beyond money. It's beyond recognition. It's beyond a lot of different things. It's even beyond our spouses and our kids. It's us as human beings wanting to be purposeful and meaningful at any given age and time. So I don't take psychology lightly in that sense. Make yourself meaningful in the way that matters to you. Whether you're going to volunteer to a cause you always cared for, whether you're going to be active in something you care and passionate about, whether you reach out to people that matter to you. But take that on and take, and take that on with, with, with happiness and grace because you're doing it not just for your health. You're doing it for others, you're doing it for your health, but you're doing it because it matters. And so what I find the thing that combats depression most is becoming meaningful and purposeful to you and to others. And so that's another area that helps in combating cognitive decline. Now, I mentioned men. I'm also going to mention women. But I looked a lot into studies of longevity. What makes a difference for people who live longer um, versus not? And some interesting data came out. And I've looked at whether this data repeats itself uh, every time we collect it. And we found some interesting things. We find that women generally um, overall live longer than men. You heard that before? Yeah. OK. The question is, do they want to? No, but, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm, jo I'm joking here. Um, there are different hypotheses why women live longer. So one that's running around is because women are XX and men are XY generally. And there is more, there's some disorders that Y chromosome carries that women don't have to deal with. And if there are X chromosome related diseases, women have two Xs, so they have a better way to fight it. So men are more vulnerable to diseases. That's one hypothesis. There's another hypothesis. And we talk now from the psychology side of things. And I'm going to tell you from clinical experience, OK? Men and women deal with pain differently. Men and women communicate differently. Generally, we require men to deal with it. We require men to fix it. Women don't wait for any of that. They talk to their girlfriends. <laughs> they talk all day. But what we find, they talk and they cry. And the more we talk and the more we cry, generally, the better we do. Our cortisol goes down. Our emotions are being processed. We get validation, all kinds of stuff. Men think and process things differently. I see it a lot in therapy. I do, I do a small percent of therapy for fun with couples. And it doesn't matter what age it is. I see that women can talk a lot, but I'm not sure if they're going to change anything when they come the next time. 
men might not talk much. They sit there, first they sit like this, then they sit like this, you know. They tell me with their body, I want a beer, I don't want a beer. Um, and it's harder for me to gain their, their trust, you know? It's hard for me to, to be with them there. But then when I get it, and when they say something, generally they choose carefully what they're saying, generally. I'm generalizing, guys. Don't be angry with me. Um, and they generally say the particular thing they wanted to say. And if they say yes to me at the end for something, there is a really good chance that next time they come, they did something about it. So the commitment is longer to get, but once you get it, there is a, generally a better follow-up. And I am generalizing, so. Uh, but it is something to understand when it comes to the psychology and men and women, and why for men it's very difficult to deal with depression. As we age, depression can creep in and big questions show up, and big pains. And it's really important, and I'm speaking to the crowd here of men and the women who have a man they love, to encourage men who you see in pain to talk to someone they trust and to process it through. We find that it's making a big difference. Men do seem to have their longevity interrupted because of emotional issues because of all kinds of feelings that come in, unresolved issues. So it's important to address that. There was a, a study that kept repeating itself, um, and you know I, I always want to question it over and over again, but it seems that the results are, are consistent, that look to see who lives longer, married men, married women. Okay. So what they saw is that there wasn't a significant correlation for women, whether they were married, they were unmarried, um, happily married and unhappily married in terms of aging, of how long they lived. Now, the quality of life, that's a different story. But overall, statistically, there wasn't a big difference. That wasn't the case for men. Men who lived the longest were the happily married men. Men who lived next longest were the unmarried men. Men who lived the shortest were the unhappily married men. <laughs> I did not write the study or the results. So, uh, but I do find that an important point because relationships matter. Family matters. So it's not just about marriage, but it's about children too. So I mentioned it at the beginning, that happiness with your children and happiness with your spouse and having positive activities with them is going to matter how long you're going to live. So make sure that you put effort in that area. Sometimes I have to have a family meeting with everyone. Um, also the kids come in. And I tell them, you love mom, you love dad? Oh yeah, I love them. Well, don't tell them everything. <laughs> really? Yeah, don't. Don't, because they're going to think about it. They're not going to sleep at night. They're going to worry about it the next day. They can't really do much about it. You're laughing because you know the story. <laughs> but it really does matter. So it's OK to say to your kids, you know, I thrive on positivity. So unless I really need to know, don't tell me everything. <laughs> it's OK. And then, of course, your kids find their ways of handling their pressure. So that's another important thing in, in longevity of our brain and well-being and our body. And finally, I'll say this. The moment, you know, aging is a thing that comes to all of us. The moment when somebody gets a diagnosis that there is a decline, that's never fun. But there are things you can do. The people that have a fighting spirit, the people that make changes in their life, bottom, bottom line, they live longer and they live better. The people that are in denial and don't want to deal with it and are so afraid, they don't even want to be tested, they have a different outcome. We see it all the time. 
So just like so many other years in your life, you went into it like warriors, that's the thing you're going to go into like a warrior because it's going to make a difference. It's going to make a difference. And have a good clinical support, have good doctors you trust that care about you. Make sure you got your, your team in play to take care of you. I will also say there's a lot of supplements out there. There's all kinds of things. The diet component that I touched on is supremely important because your brain needs a lot of different things to operate really well. The area of reducing anxiety is, and stress is extremely important. Increasing creativity, really important. Being very active and very social, really important. Uh, being in touch with your medical team to make sure that the diagnosis is correct, that it's being checked, that your medications are okay, extremely important. If you are on too many medications, get a second opinion. Find out, because some medications promote cognitive decline. Some medications over time can cause memory loss. So you need to be very educated about the medications that you take, and if you are diagnosed with the beginning of memory loss, have your neurologist evaluate your medications, okay, to make sure that you are still taking what is really necessary for you. And then finally, I will say that don't necessarily buy into lots of ideas online and all kinds of exciting things because as it stands today, we still don't have a cure. And I will say that even if you have a diagnosis of, of a condition, no one can really tell you with certainty what's going to happen, how long you're going to carry on the Alzheimer's or, or the issue, how, you know, how you're going to feel, what's going to happen. No one can really tell you that with certainty. I have patients ask that all the time. We know as clinicians, some things tend to decline faster than others, but it's not always the case. And I think that I personally as a clinician feel it's not very responsible for me to give a time for the person because I simply don't know. There's so many factors that can fall into it. And finally, make sure you have trusted individuals, whether it's, if it's your children that you trust or someone else that knows uh, everything about, about you that's important, from your finances in play to where you're going to want to be you know, in 10, 15 years from now, to um, what your medical conditions are, to what treatments are important to you. You should have an integrated care that's really important because that's going to come to kick in at some point in time down the line. And it makes a difference on how, on how we get treated at that time. And uh, you know, with that in mind, I would say that if there are any unresolved issues, do them while you've, you've got it all together. You know? Do it now. Because, well, it's an important recommendation that I'm telling you because I've seen all kinds of scenarios. And when you get, you have uh, control over everything and you have the knowledge, then uh, you can age in a graceful, beautiful way. And, and that definitely happens. Um, and finally, I will say that in this age when you are active, you're going to lectures, you're doing things, that's the time to learn memory strategies. Uh, there are various kinds of great memory strategies that rely on association and on imagination and coding, and we're not going to go into it today because you have to actually sit and learn them. But it's actually not a bad idea to learn skills today because you have a chance to carry them much longer. So if we try to teach it to the person five years after diagnosis, it's much harder. But if we teach them right away, then they, they, show, they tend to show that they carry it for a much longer period of time. Um, and then I will say one nice little note uh, before I take questions. Uh, and that is about a memory box. Anybody ever heard about a memory box? 
couple of people. Okay, so there's a really fun little trick that helps us reduce our frustration when we lose things. How many of you lose things sometimes and get super frustrated? <laughs> I think all of us. Um, so I have a household with six people and four of them, their brain is not fully developed. Well, maybe five, let's see. No, but, <laughs> um, you know, so there's a lot of activity and then we have grandparents coming in and also the kids from the neighborhood. My house is kind of like that. And so things can be, mis they, things get misplaced constantly. It was very frustrating. So I took something that I learned from aging and I could implement it even at my house. So this is something you can tell anyone. So you take basically a box that you like and you buy it for the number of rooms in your house. So let's say you go to the market, you love this woven basket and you need to choose a particular color that stands out. So not a box that the same color like your couch because that's not gonna work. You know, a bright, strong color, something you pay attention to when you go into the room and buy it per the number of significant rooms in your house. And that's gonna be your memory box and you place it in each room. And it doesn't need to be big, it could be small. And you train yourself to every time if you have something important, it goes in the memory box. Now because we wander around the house, we always have, oh, now we got a note, now we got our phone, we got the keys, we got, you know, everybody's got something that's important. And so you know that important things go in the memory box. And you train yourself to do that. What we find when people do that, when they lose something, it's likely going to be in the memory box. And they just go look at their memory boxes and they find it and they look, at, oh my gosh, I left it in this room, you know? Um, but it does happen. It does actually seem to work for a lot of people, this little trick. So, it's a trick that you can try. Um, but I find that it works with kids too, it works with, with a lot of people who are busy and have a lot of things going on. It's much easier to search four, five, or six boxes than searching everywhere, right? So that's another little trick. Well, I covered just some of the things that are good for your brain as you get older and how they relate to neuroscience. And I'd be glad to take some questions. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Dr. D. We really enjoyed that, didn't we? Um, I have a couple things I want to mention. First of all, isn't that what the Meredith Institute's all about, too? We're looking at, it's looking at these four uh, pillars of the Meredith Institute. We're academically rigorous, we're mentally stimulating, we're socially engaging, we're health improving. You know, the reason why we exist is to help you as well, as, as aging uh, adults, to help uh, help you become, li live well, and help your memory and help your brain as well. So I just wanna just piggyback on that as well. Thank you very much for a great presentation. Now, Dr. D has written a book called Combating Dementia in 30 Days. And I have three copies that I give out. The, uh, and, and the question is, who do I give these to? It's any random person, or how am I gonna do this? Let's see. Who has a birthday today? Anybody have a birthday today? Are you really? Yes, I do. I'm a brown hog. Someone come and get a book. Do you mind coming up and? Oh, you got two birthdays. All right, for the third, the third and final book. It's got to be a memory question. <laughs> Let me think. Um, can you guess the, uh, uh, my, I'm going to guess um, my birthday. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, let's see. Let me think of something. What's that? Who came the farthest distance? <laughs> San Clemente, anybody? What's that? Oh, Maryland. Oh, is there someone from Maryland here? Do you remember your, how to get back? <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna give you the book because you would like it. Here we go. All right, now we're gonna have a time for questions and answers. 
Um, let me go ahead and start with Lynn. Go ahead and. Uh, you didn't mention anything about sleep, and I've been reading about sleep being extremely important. Could you comment on that? Yes. So while I'm mentioning sleep, I'll mention also two other things. There are so many things about aging and brain health, it's hard to cover it in one lecture. But I'll mention that sleep does, the quality of our sleep does decline as we age. In fact, we go all the way down to 25% of our sleep being REM sleep, which REM is the most important sleep that we're getting all the way since we're, we're young. Babies get a lot more REM sleep, for example. And so making your sleep better and the quality of your sleep better is very important. Doing sleep hygiene, which is preparing yourself to sleep two hours before you go to sleep and getting into a routine is key. We find that no matter what age you're at, we are trainable in a sense that if we keep a strict routine before we go to sleep and we avoid certain activities and certain foods, it's going to increase our chances of having a better sleep. I will say that having no exercise in your schedule is going to hurt your sleep. Exercise allows for your muscles to work in a better way, for your oxygen, like I said, and, and, and blood flow issues. It reduces uh, neuropathy and other problems that like to show up in your sleep. So keeping yourself regularly exercised is gonna help as well. It is important to know that we sleep less when we're older. So there's some things that you cannot, you cannot necessarily change. I will also touch on quickly about sexuality. Uh, some of us are more sexually active than others when we're older. It is recommended that if you can, and it's healthy for you to continue to be sexually active. We find that a lot of it is in your mind when we get older, um, there's a lot of worries that you're not gonna be able to be sexual or function, so then you don't. So when you feel more free and relaxed, you're much more likely to be sexually active. It is recommended with the exception of particular medical conditions. You can run it by your physician. And I will also say that intimacy is extremely important. So the hormone of love, oxytocin, is being produced even if you just get touched in any way that's loving. Even when you look at someone you love, you produce oxytocin. Even if you pet your dog, you produce oxytocin. So it, I can't sell it to you enough. So love, intimacy, touch, warmth, like I said, those positive experiences are very important. Just like babies tend to not thrive if they don't get touched and their brain is smaller, uh, adults and older people, if they don't get touched, they don't operate as well as they can be. So that's very important. Um, I hope I answered some of that question. That is awesome. I want more love. <laughs> Let's go back to the back. Up in the back. Uh, yeah. some, someone recently <clears throat> mentioned that uh, the bacteria associated with gingivitis was somehow related to Alzheimer's. Have you heard something about that? Uh, yes, so multiple medical conditions are associated, not just Alzheimer's, are suggested to be associated with the onset of Alzheimer or other dementias. But it's important to know that it's a host of things. So gen gingivitis essentially is uh, the presence of bacteria in your mouth and the ability for bacteria to enter uh, your body. And so that's going to increase the chances for you to develop all kinds of things. It's important to know that the development of dementia can come because of so many things. In fact, they looked at results of um, HPV testing, which is the human populace virus, and the, on, the uh, chances to develop brain cancer. So we, we need to understand that, yes, there is a connection, okay, but it's a the way I see it, it's a holistic connection between your gut and the rest of your body and your brain, and viruses and bacteria travel in your body and in your brain. They don't just stay in one area. So if you are exposed, like gingivitis will make you exposed um, to uh, more to viruses and bacteria, you're much more likely to develop a host of condition, one of them a neurodegenerative disorder. So the answer it is that, in general, 
preventing as much as possible toxins to enter your body within reason and increasing your health and making sure that hygiene is there, doesn't have to be just your mouth but other areas in your body, is going to likely to be translated to prevention of diseases later on. Thank you. Right over here. Is there any medication that uh, you could recommend for memory loss? Mm. And I've had this mic, this mic in my hand for so long, I almost forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's always the, the $1 million question. Um, and I mentioned that briefly before. As it stands today, we don't have significant medications that are going to improve your memory. The activities that I told you today, the things that I told you today, I wasn't saying them because they're just fun, but because we clinically know they actually make a difference for you. There are medications that your neurologist may prescribe to you. An example would be Aricept or Denazepil. Um, it's called this as well. But we know that their effect is not for everyone, so we would say for some individuals, modest effect and temporary on top of that. So that's where we stand today. Thank you. Uh, right here in the back, right in front of me. Um, you spoke earlier about uh, making sure that you have in place an integrated care team. And um, I'm, I, have, I wonder how you would go about developing that team. I find that um, my doctors do not, usually don't talk to each other. I'm a lung cancer survivor, and when I was under active therapy, I had a fantastic team. I think I had the A team, but when I moved to Southern California to be closer to my children, I can't seem to find that kind of health care anywhere. The pulmonologist doesn't talk to the oncologist, and nobody talks to the primary care doctor. He's kind of left out in left field and doesn't really, isn't really involved in anything? It's a great question. It's, it's a great problem, actually, in the medical field. Uh, coordination of care is what you're talking about. And you have to be your own advocate. Some doctors thrive for coordination of care. When I get a patient, I want to talk to the other doctors that work with that patient. I want to talk to the hematologist and the neurologist and the psychiatrist because I know we have to talk to each other to make sure that whatever is being prescribed and implemented, that everyone is aware of it. And I also like to get the insight of the other clinicians and then provide some of my own two cents. But not all clinicians use this proactive approach. It does take time for clinicians to do that, to pick up the phone, to chase after the other doctors, and we all have crazy schedules. But the effort, you know, some of us can make that effort. Also know some can afford doing that. Unfortunately, some doctors work under umbrellas that they have to see so many more patients that, that, than they possibly can. Uh, and so actually, this is a different area, but just to throw it out there, uh, about 52% of doctors regret becoming doctors after becoming doctors. And one of the reasons is because there's a lot of depression among doctors because doing our art today sometimes can be very difficult. I went out of uh, academic and hospitals and opened my own clinics so I can have the luxury of doing the things the way I want to do it. But most doctors, but it's not an easy path and most doctors you know, are not made to do things this way. And so it's tough for the doctors as well. But I will say, be your own advocate. Be your own advocate. I always tell my, my patients, if you're not sure about something, get a second opinion. And if you want us to do something, don't wait for us to do it. You make it happen. Say, doctor so-and-so, I want you to talk to all my other doctors. I want all of us to know what's going on. I want us to work as a team. So be your own advocate. And if you don't like a particular doctor, switch to another doctor. I mean, there's just so many of us around. You don't have to get locked on one doctor and be miserable. 
you know, switch to another doctor that's going to work with you. Yeah. I have a right. question. Thank you very much. Just a second. I, I have a question up here at the back. We have lots of time for questions, by the way. So, you know, please just feel free. But we're going to go through this. This is very helpful, Dr. Judy. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, in the very back. Hi. Um, you mentioned there were some supplements that could help. What are they? Okay, so there's just a host of things that you can take. There's certain uh, spices. I didn't talk today about spices, but it's in my book. And there are, spices are very underrated in our diet, and, they're, and they should be uh, more recognized for brain health. There's a lot of studies that look at what different types of spices of high quality can do for your brain. And there are some supplements out there that combine um, several different spices in one, in one um, um, bottle that's going to provide you with some enhancement for your brain. I like to add it just fresh in the food, and I don't think about it. I add it everywhere, and nobody can tell. Um, and it's good for us. And I will say that there's other supplements per what you're missing. So there is a blood work that I like to recommend for my, my clients, which called uh, nutritional deficiencies. And it's also called sometimes anti-aging. And it's a more comprehensive um, blood work that tackles uh, areas of weakness that might be in older age that we don't detect in the typical blood work. And it looks at things also like magnesium and zinc and other, and other potential deficiencies you have. So then you want the supplements that you're taking to tackle the areas that you are deficient, significantly deficient with. But remember that it's one thing to take things. It's another thing whether your body absorbs it. So you then have to have a discussion with your clinician about whether you are eating or taking uh, the, the components that are uh, going to help you absorb what it is that you need to take and your absorption level can be measured. So to your question, if you are to take things, I would take the things that the body actually needs. You know, um, we didn't talk today about, uh, you know, spirituality and everything else, but which is very important for your brain. But, you know, I, I, my personal belief is that our body is made in a very beautiful, sophisticated way and that we need to address the areas, we need to work with our body. We need to address the areas that our body functions best at in the most natural way possible because that's how the Almighty made it. Now, uh, I see it this way, but regardless of that, even from a physiological perspective, you first have to make sure you're actually getting the fundamentals that you need. And that was the point I was making at the beginning that people forget, um, that you not only just need to avoid things that are not good for you, but you need to make sure your body actually gets the fundamental building blocks that it needs. And I'll say finally that about 80% of the processes in your body are made with protein, with all kinds of proteins, and most individuals eat a much higher percent of carbohydrates than proteins in their diet. So most people are deficient in getting the sufficient protein that they need. So my book also talks about the importance of proteins and what kind of proteins you can eat that are healthy for you. Thank you so much. This gentleman right here. Yes. Uh, first of all, Dorit, I enjoyed your lecture very, very much. Thank you. It, uh, it's very influential. Uh, I do have boxes all over the house. And I cannot read them because my hand shakes when I write. So I, so I have a very, very good friend who is technically, technology very, very good. And he told me that you should carry the box with you all the time. And it's called the telephone. <laughs> well, yeah, everybody is laughing, but he's got the answer. You have to carry the box with you, and it's called the telephone. You don't have to worry about handwriting or anything. You record everything. And it's all in one place, and it's with you even in the bathroom. <laughs> Thank you. I, um, I, I, who has a mic right now? Just a second. Oh, right over here. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't see you. I was born in Loma Linda. I remember the first MRI, three floors tall. It was a monster. You could, you could, you could not even have the magnetic on your, on your watch to see at night. That would, 
then throw the MRI on. Now, a year ago in Chicago at the Old Timers uh, Dementia Conference, they said you can read the retina and find stage one dementia. Is, what's the latest, is that still true? <coughs> Uh, thank you for your question. So the question was, can you read in the eye, in the retina, whether somebody has uh, propens propensity to develop dementia or they already have it? So the eye, I don't want to go too much into the science of it today, but the eye is actually, you know, we say the eye is the window to the soul. The eye is actually the window to a lot of medical conditions and a lot of different things. So detection for dementia is moving progressively fast. Uh, you can see there are suggestions, I did look at that study, it looks pretty promising that you can detect dementia in the retina, but I'm telling you that neuropsych testing detects it way earlier, and it gives me much more. I don't wanna know just that somebody has some memory loss, I wanna know what else is going on. I wanna know their strengths. I wanna know their weaknesses. I wanna know if they retain their vocabulary, if they have good word fluency, if they have fine motor uh, problems or not, if they have gross motor problems, if they have executive dysfunction, which is the frontal lobe of your brain. If they have, neuropsych testing gives me a lot of information. And so while you may detect dementia in the retina, all it is is that it tells you that something is going on but it doesn't tell you everything else I would want to know. So I would still want to know everything else, you know, so I can actually deal with it. But yes, you can, um, there's also detection for dementia with blood tests, and um, you can have propensity via uh, genetics these days, right? But to me, it's not just about the detection, but it's about what we're doing after that. And then if we are, concerned whether there is a cognitive decline or, law or not, I will tell you that I uh, serve also as an expert for the courts, and even if imaging results show that there might be a brain dysfunction, because I also do brain injury assessments and criminality, um, the neuropsych data tells me if the person is likely to lie or not. It tells me if they put good effort. It tells me if they have brain damage um, from an injury. It tells me a lot of data, and, and generally, this data supersedes um, the imaging results and other, um, and other tests. So I guess that's my uh, thought about it. We have time for two more questions, and one is up here in the back, I understood, I believe. Does someone have a mic up there? Okay, why don't we go over here, there you go. Hello, uh, yes, I found it very interesting, very helpful. Uh, I had a uh, question, uh, recently I've been reading uh, uh, about the placebo effect, that if you take medications or you take a placebo, and you believe it's gonna work, much, uh, much better percentage uh, of it working and, and helping, if you could discuss that. The other thing is, uh, you discussed uh, a lot of good foods. What, what are the bad foods to avoid? Uh, <laughs> and uh, the third, uh, just to get back to su supplements, uh, what do you think of uh, uh, a capsule wild salmon oil? Does that, is that uh, of any uh, interest, uh, any helpful, and, and also turmeric? Thank yes. you. Thank my, you my pleasure. Um, so I'll, I'll say a few things. First of all, a lot of the questions that you're asking, a lot of the information, a lot about foods, it is in my comprehensive course, book and videos. If you tell me, if you email us and say, I've been to Dr. Gaines's lecture, they will give you 50% off for it. And I do it only for the lectures that I go to. So that's, if you wanna know further information, that's available to you. Just email us and I'm gonna leave my cards here. Now, you asked about turmeric. So turmeric is one of the spices that we know is very good for you. Um, so far, UCLA studies do look at that and it seems promising. It does need to be fresh um, to be potent. And if you, if the problem with it, if you cook it too long, then the value of it goes away, so you have to put it towards the end in your food. You can also take it concentrated in pills. Uh, there's all kinds of ways you can take it, but turmeric, not just turmeric, all the orange-based spices 
are very good for your brain. But they're not the only ones. I, there are 13 magical ones that are really, really good for you. And I, like I said, I use them um, all the time for all of my family members with, with wealth. You know, we enjoy having them. They also reduce your desire for sugar. We didn't talk today about sugar, but I talk about it in, in my book. Uh, sugar is a major, major harmful component for your brain, but it's highly addicting. Spices, when you increase your spices consumption, what we find is generally people's um, interest in sugar declines, their taste buds change, um, they get satisfied in a different way, and they tend to also eat less. Um, I, I will also say that when you talked about placebo, um, Dr. Laversky at UCLA and others um, have spent a lifetime researching this area, fascinating area of placebo with aging and aging care. And you, you are correct that the studies show that um, the placebo effect was very high, meaning that if we told, we, when they gave a sugar pill versus an actual uh, pill that's supposed to help for memory or anything else, uh, people that believed that the pill is going to help them did much better. So this is why I was talking about depression and your mental state and where you're at and how you see your life. And that's why I wrote Combat Dementia, go into it as a warrior because your mental state is very, very powerful um, in, in showing results. So yes, the placebo effect is high. I hope I answer your question. You've given us a real great direction for how to face uh, dementia, how to combat, like you said, we really appreciate it. Let's give another warm hand for Dr. Yeah, really. uh, Dr. D, we available up, up, up front here for questions, if you have any personal questions, ask her. Thank you so much, see you next Thank week. Thank you, everyone. For Dr. Lights. Great.